Um, now we uh, move on to uh, our dear friend uh, Linda Dryden, who is Professor of English Literature in the School of Arts and Creative Industries at uh, Napier University um, in Edinburgh. She started her academic career at uh, Napier in um, 1998 by a PhD entitled Romance and Anti-Romance in Conrad's Malay Fiction. She has published three monographs, Joseph Conrad and the Imperial Romance in 1999, The Modern Gothic and Literary Doubles, Stevenson, Wilde and Wells in 2003, and Joseph Conrad and H.D. Wells, the Fadesiec Literary Scene in 2015, all published with uh, Paul Grave. Linda um, created and manages the Robert Louis Stevenson website and is co-editor of the uh, Journal of Stevenson uh, Studies. And she organized also the last um, uh, Stevenson <laughs> Conference at Edinburgh, which was a memorable one. <laughs> it was indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah? I'll start with, uh, I mean, I, in your programs you have a title. I'm, I'm, I'm going to offer you an alternative title, which is called Licking the Chops of Memory, the Pleasure, in brackets, and Pain of Being Mr. Hyde. This talk I apologize, it's not theorized, it's, it, 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 it's not intense. It's, it's my thoughts on pleasure and pain in, in, in Jekyll and Hyde. Maybe I'll work it up later. So this conference is all about, oh, and by the way, it won't be very long. <laughs> this conference is all about Robert Louis Stevenson and pleasure, as we know. And this paper will honor that theme while recognizing that pleasure and pain can be inextricably linked. And Jekyll, and I'm sorry, I'm just used to calling him Jekyll. I know he, I should say Jekyll, but it's just my way of, of sorry, Richard. <laughs> uh, I'll, I will say Jekyll, it's just the default <laughs> position. Um, I'm sorry, I must my, uh, Jekyll's terrible history reveals that truth. We can derive a perverse pleasure from a certain kind of exquisite pain and infliction of pain on others can, for some, offer a masochistic kind of pleasure. I would contend that Dr. Jekyll, in his guise as Mr. Hyde, is one such person who seeks his pleasure not only in physical gratification, but also in the pain and confusion he causes in others. In this paper, I'll be exploring the various pleasures that Jekyll derives from his murderous, degenerate career as Hyde, and the various pleasures indulged in by other characters in the novella, as well as considering how Stevenson was exploring human, the human relationship with pleasure and pain. Now, uh, Caroline yesterday identified 15 times the word pleasure appeared in the text. I only identified 13. My, my, my search wasn't scientific. It was done by the Internet Archive, so I bow to <coughs> Caroline's um, greater knowledge. Um, but the word enjoyed, enjoy, appears four times. Delight, glee, gratification are all used at various points in the story to describe Jekyll's emotions in the actions of his alter ego. And there are no doubt a number of other synonyms for pleasure and its effects to be detected in the story. But pleasure is the dominant term, and the fact that it occurs so frequently in such a short, dark, tale reveals to us the motivation behind Jekyll's macabre transformation. His repression as the respectable doctor has the effect of causing him to yearn for release from his perceived bondage in order to gratify his appetites for pleasure. This much we all know, I mean this, is, this goes without saying. The notion of pleasure thus sits at the heart of the novella as its driving force, the impetus for its action and the motivation for Jekyll's reincarnation as Hyde. But pleasure is, after all, a human stroke animal experience, and thus it can be seen at play throughout the novella in the context of other characters. So, 
The novella opens with a long description of Mr. Utterson, a man who was as austere with himself, drank gin, sorry, who was austere with himself, drank gin when he was alone to mortify a taste for vintages. And if anybody can explain what that means to me, please do so afterwards. Um, and though he enjoyed the theatre, had not crossed the doors of one for 20 years. Yet. Yet. Despite these suggestions of austerity and self-denial, Utterson represses a desire for the gratification of his various lusts. At friendly meetings and when the wine was to his taste, something eminently human beckoned from his eye. And he had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy, note, at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds. Immediately then, in the opening paragraph of the novella, Stevenson sets up his theme of repression and hints at the inner longings for forbidden pleasure, even in the most buttoned down of individuals. Like Jekyll's potion, wine releases Utterson's human enjoyment from the bonds that he and Victorian society have placed on it, and his almost envy of the nefarious exploits of his friends looks forward to Jekyll Jekyll's vicarious pleasures in Hyde's crimes. But, and here's the crux, Utterson is, in essence, a moral individual. He reigns in his desire for pleasure, but his pleasures are not criminal in nature, unlike Jekyll stroke Hyde. In this respect, then, Utterson serves as a kind of foil to Jekyll, a corrective, albeit one that is lean, long, dusty, dreary, and somehow lovable. It's also interesting to reflect on the fact that the novella opens with a long description of a character who is not the main protagonist. But Utterson is vital to the narrative because it is he who seeks out Hyde and not Enfield, the well-known man about town. Utterson, the dry, sober, repressed lawyer, serves as a detective ably suited to ferreting out Jekyll's secret by virtue of that very sobriety, the exact opposite of Jekyll, the man who successfully subdues and represses his desire for pleasure, is the man who will ultimately unravel the mystery of the man who succumbs to his innermost lusts. So, what are these pleasures that Jekyll is so intent on indulging? Some of Jekyll's pleasure lies in the comfort of his surroundings. His hallway is a pet fancy, which Utterson was wont to speak of as the pleasantest room in London. It is warmed by an open fire and furnished in costly oak. This luxury is replicated in two of Hyde's rooms in his lodgings, which Utterson observes are furnished with luxury and good taste. There's a closet of wine. Wine is mentioned nine times in the course of this narrative. That's my unscientific survey. Uh, I, I suspect it might be mentioned more. Um, I quite like that. <laughs> the, place, the plate was of silver, the napery elegant, a good picture hung upon the walls, and the carpets were of many plies and agreeable in colour. This all begs the question of whether the elegance of all this is Jekyll's doing, or that of Hyde. Did Hyde retain some of Jekyll's taste for sartorial elegance, despite his depravity and seeming carelessness for all things decorous? Or did Jekyll furnish these rooms himself when in his guise as Hyde? It's one of the conundrums at the heart of the, of the issues of identity and psychology in the novel and contributes to its sense of mystery. But that aside, the impression remains, in, remains that enjoyment in luxury is just another of the many pleasures mentioned in the book. As I said, the, 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 the changed title of this book includes uh, a quotation from the moment when Jekyll spontaneously begins to morph into Hyde. He says, I sat in the sun on a bench the animal within me licking the chops of memory. The spiritual side, a little drowsed, promising subsequent penitence, but not yet moved to begin. 
By this point, Jekyll Stroke Hyde has already murdered Sir Danvers Carew, trampled over a young child, and committed untold other atrocities only vaguely, vaguely alluded to. Yet, yet, Jekyll can sit languorously in the January sun with its promise of spring and relish the memories of activities that have included child cru cruelty and murder. Jekyll refers here to the animal within me. And I want to pause for a moment over the potential ambiguity of that phrase. The animal within me. Is Jekyll, is Jekyll referring to Hyde as an animal? Or is he subconsciously recognizing that Hyde too, as he said himself, was himself? The answer is unclear, and it's symptomatic of Jekyll's self-delusion and hypocrisy, it must be said, that his narrative in Jekyll's full statement of the case never actually addresses the fact that Jekyll is fully complicit in the crimes of Hyde because Hyde is in fact Jekyll. And this is pertinent to the notion of pleasure in the text because it's from Sorry, it's from his exploits as Hyde that Jekyll derives his perverse pleasure. The reason why he is sitting in Re Regent's Park licking the chops of men memory. I've mentioned um, the luxury in which Jekyll leads his life. At various points in the narrative, characters are seen in elegant surroundings, eating dinner, supping fine wines, as I've already mentioned, and enjoying the pleasure of each other's company. Jekyll's home is spacious and costly in a desirable, desirable part of town. He has an enviable job and enjoys good, a good reputation as a respectable doctor. And I know people have talked about, is Jekyll actually a medical doctor? But looking at the text and looking at what Jekyll enjoys in his profession, I'm convinced he is a medical doctor, actually. Um, he has servants, a circle of friends who look out for him and care about his well-being. All of his needs are catered for. Well, almost all. It's a common place to note that he seems to be unmarried. There's no mention of a wife, either current, estranged, or departed. His bachelor existence, however, is comfortable, even enviably luxurious. And yet, he feels repressed, confined, unable to indulge his desires. This leads me to ask what exactly it is that Jekyll wants. What are the pleasures that he cannot indulge in? Fine food and wine are in plentiful supply. Home comfort is on frequent display in the text. And friendship is in abundant evidence. However, love, affection, sex are never mentioned in the text. Stevenson's novella is also devoid of these elements, is, is so devoid of these elements as to be deliberate. In the midst of all of this luxury, reputation, and male companionship, Henry Jekyll is isolated and alone. He has no companionship, and if his preference is for female company, then any suggestion of that is signally absent in the text. Sexual pleasure is never mentioned and the only suggestion of sexuality comes through queer interpretations of the text by critics like Wayne Kostenbaum. And critics like Kostenbaum point to the homosexual and possible homosexual, homo, sorry, homosexual atmosphere of the novel and certainly the lack of a wife and some other nuances in the text can lend themselves to queer readings. Whichever situation Stevenson intended, the fact remains that he has no apparent romantic involvement with either gender and no evident sexual gratification. It is for this reason that so many film and television adaptations of the text have felt able to ascribe to Hyde sexual violence and perversion and invariably introduce prostitutes into a text that is notorious for its lack of female characters. Sexual pleasure is never mentioned, but it's the focus of most film versions. The reason for this is that the narrative is so evasive that reading between the lines is usually the only recourse the reader has to fathom 
what constitutes the nefarious crimes of Hyde. And I think someone this morning spoke about how Stevenson never states what he means, that it's always unsaid. If Jekyll was in Hyde Park, licking the chops of memory, we must assume that Hyde, uh, sorry, that Hyde's activities beyond child cruelty and random murder will probably include physical and sexual gratification. In writing Jekyll and Hyde, Stevenson was, of course, restricted by the censorship of his contemporary world and could not publish anything that was offensive or graphically sexual. The genius of Stevenson's technique in this narrative is the suggestiveness of the text that leaves the reader to imagine how Hyde gratifies the lusts of his wire host. We participate in the creation of the text through our own imaginations of what Hyde may be getting up to. The exact nature of the debauchery of Hyde is in effect left to the imagination of the individual reader. But to turn back to Jekyll and his pursuit of pleasure. Clearly the luxury and reputation that he enjoys as a professional Victorian gentleman is not sufficient to satisfy him, and thus he creates his evil alter ego. Part of Jekyll's pleasure in being Hyde is in the ability to enjoy the forbidden pleasures he desires without censure. But as he puts it himself in his full statement of the case, he had a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, such as had made the happiness of many, but such as I found it hard to reconcile with my imperious desire to carry my head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. To resolve this impasse, he embarks on his alchemic necromancy and hide as a vehicle for his illicit pleasures. However, before we look closer at the pleasures delivered in Hyde's persona, let's pause for a moment to consider those pleasures he gets from his professional life. Jekyll claims to derive satisfaction from his professional role and reputation. In dividing the self into two, the more upright twin could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path, doing the good things in which he found his pleasure and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of this extraneous evil. So Jekyll claims to get pleasure from his career and reputation, but still desires the forbidden indulgences of Hyde. He claims not to be a hypocrite. Both sides of me were in dead earnest. Uh, and he admits that his Hyde-like behavior, while still Jekyll, was as much part of himself as the virtuous doctor. But Jekyll actually wants to have his cake and eat it, and as such, he is indeed a hypocrite. He claims that other men have before hired bravos to tra transact their crimes, while their own per person and reputations sat under shelter. I was the first that ever did so for his pleasure, says Jekyll. It's notable that without even recognizing his own hypocrisy, Jekyll acknowledges his motivation for becoming Hyde, personal pleasure. And the word pleasure permeates his description of his early career as Hyde. In one paragraph, the word appears four times. It's clear that Jekyll relishes the self-abandon of Hyde. In his persona as Hyde, the undignified pleasures that he used to seek when incognito soon began to turn towards monstrous. And when returning from an excursion as Hyde, he was often plunged into a kind of wonder at his vicarious depravity. Note, not disgust, or fear, or shame, but wonder. Jekyll is enjoying this because he believes he can escape without blame or censure. Quote, long quotation here. This familiar that I called my own soul and sent forth alone to do his good pleasure was, being, was a being inherently malign and villainous. His every act and thought centered on self drinking pleasure and bestial avidity from any degree of torture to another, like a man of stone. Jekyll, though, cannot admit to himself that his pleasures as Hyde are for his Jekyll's gratification. The only check on his activities are the pangs of his conscience, and because he feels invincible in his guise as Hyde, he can set that aside. 
It's only when in danger or of being discovered after the murder of Carew that Jekyll tries to rein in his beast. He calls Hyde the animal inside of himself, but that most basic of animal instincts, the urge towards self-preservation, is what motivates Jekyll to forego his pleasures. This brings me back to the issue of pain in the novel. There are two forms of pain here, the physical and the mental or emotional. When he first drinks the potion, his body endures agonizing pain, quote, the most racking pain succeeded, a grinding in the bones, deadly nausea and horror of the spirit that cannot be exceeded in the hour of birth or death. Well, clearly he wasn't a woman. He wouldn't know this. <laughs> this is the pain of his transformation. And yet Jekyll is prepared to endure this time and time again for the pleasure of being Hyde. Why? The answer lies in his immediate reaction upon turning into Hyde. And here is a long quotation. There was something strange in my sensations, something indescribably new and from its very novelty indescribably incredibly sweet. I felt younger, lighter, happier in body. Within I was conscious of a heady recklessness, a current of sensual images running like a, a mill race in my fancy, a solution of the bonds of obligation, an unknown but not innocent freedom of the soul. I knew myself at first breath in this new life to be more wicked tenfold more wicked, sold a slave to my original evil, and the thought in that moment braced and delighted me like wine. Jekyll feels intoxicated his new in his new being, freed from constraints, and with his sensual and dangerous inclinations strengthened and liberated. This is the pleasure for which he is willing to undergo the agonizing transformation. There's no guiltless pleasure to be had for Jekyll without that particular physical pain. Thus, as I mentioned at the beginning, pleasure and pain are indivisible from each other. Furthermore, the murder of Carew affords a perverse pleasure to Jekyll Hyde. This is how he describes the murder. Instantly, the spirit of hell awoke in me and raged. With a transport of glee, I mauled the unresisting body, tasting delight from every blow, and it was not until weariness had begun to succeed that I was suddenly, in the top fit of my delirium, struck through the heart by a cold thrill of terror. Thrill note. Have I, am I overrunning? Uh, slightly. Slightly, okay. I'll, I will skip to the end. I will skip to the end because I don't want to. So, to conclude, pleasure is the motivating force and the dominant motion in, uh, emotion in the text. Everything that Jekyll does is for the gratification of his lusts and desires. He speaks frequently of his enjoyment of his reputation and his vocation as a doctor, as well as pleasures as Hyde. His self-delusion is well documented throughout the novella, even while he's unaware of the import of his words. The quotation, licking the chops of memory, is perhaps one of the most revealing of Jekyll's comments. Pleasure for him is not only the momentary gratification of his desires, but enduring memory of his misdeeds provides the mental sustenance for his vicarious pleasure. Although he would never acknowledge it, Jekyll is Hyde and Hyde is Jekyll. And for both personas, or indeed the single persona that is Jekyll Hyde, pleasure is the ultimate goal. Thank you.